This is Macro Voices, the free weekly financial podcast targeting professional finance, high net worth individuals, family offices, and other sophisticated investors. Macro Voices is all about the brightest minds in the world of finance and macroeconomics telling it like it is, bullish or bearish, no holds barred. Now, here are your hosts, Eric Townsend and Patrick Serezna. Now let's get to that chart deck. Listeners, you're going to find the download link for the post-game chart deck in your Research Roundup email. If you don't have a Research Roundup email, it means you have not yet registered at macrovoices.com. Just go to our homepage, macrovoices.com, and click on the red button over Justin's picture saying, looking for the downloads. Now, Eric, uh, let's get to crude oil, starting with the EIA inventory data. EIA printed big builds across the board, with crude oil building 5.8 million barrels, Cushing, Oklahoma drawing down 170,000 barrels, gasoline building 715,000 barrels, and distillates building 1.7 million barrels. U.S. production held unchanged at 13.1 million barrels. The rally is starting to stumble, but it's too early to say it's over. Early Thursday morning, we're just barely back above the short-term moving averages, suggesting that the rally may still have farther to run, and time spreads are still holding strong. I think this rally is entirely about geopolitical risk with the escalating situations in both Ukraine and Gaza and now Iran, and I think it's very well justified for those reasons. Whether or not we're headed to $100, well, anything's possible, but statements from the U.S. Central Command that the United States could directly attack Iran if Israel is attacked by Iran probably should have caused more concern than they did in the oil markets. Dr. Ranas Alhaji has had excellent excellent coverage of this market. I suggest following his Substack and his Twitter feed as well. Yeah, Eric, I'm, uh, on page two, I have that chart on crude oil. And one thing that I've been observing over the last six weeks is simply that the price action has remained very bullish, uh, which is, is that uh, old dips are being bought, sustained price action uh, above its moving averages, uh, higher highs, higher lows, accumulation, and now uh, a geopolitical escalation risk that has to be put into crude. Um, I mean, the most obvious technical target now that we're clear of 85 on the uh, upside is all of the uh, September, October highs that were uh, in the low 90s. Uh, but the bigger question, of course, is, is that, you know, if, if there was an escalation and disruption, if there was an escalation in Middle Eastern tensions, uh, what kind of a risk premium really can be priced into this oil markets? We'll uh, certainly see. All right, I want to get Nick into this conversation. Nick, on page three, we have the S&P 500 index. Let's just start off with the levels that you're watching. Yeah, Patrick. So right now, the spot price on SPX is approximately 5150. We have an implied move for the April 19th monthly OPEX, which is next Friday, of plus minus 90 points. That gives us an upper implied move of 5240 and a lower implied move of 5060. Right now, we have key resistance at 5250 and key support at 5100. As I mentioned in prior weeks, I'm waiting until the April OPEX to see what happens, but we have the FOMC meeting coming up end of April. That should cause a spike in volatility and to move in another direction. What I'm looking at right now is I'm seeing a lot of the mega caps hitting all-time highs. So for example, right now we have Google, Microsoft, Amazon, and Meta all at all-time highs. And that's a bit interesting to me because I see not much opportunity right now in the mega caps, but more so in the small caps. So... IWM is where I'm looking at right now for my longer term bets. In the short term, I'm bullish only on Google and Apple. Interesting observations, Nick. The uh, What I'm actually watching here is that for the first time, uh, we've seen uh, a lack of follow through by the bulls. And obviously, this inflation number uh, derailed the short term trend. Uh, we haven't seen any real technical damage to the downside yet. But, uh, you know, the first stages is that uh, the bull upside momentum starts running out and the market gets heavy, uh, which inevitably can lead to a distribution cycle. Um, 
markets just work in cycles and waves and uh, retrace major uh, moves. At some stage, a correction is a natural expected move. And uh, considering that this has been a five plus month rally that uh, uh, simply has uh, cleared well over a thousand S&P points on the upside, inevitably a correction will begin. The bigger question is, is it already begun? Uh, to me, uh, right now in the very short term, this um, 5200 level continues to be a pivot on the S&P futures charts, uh, and which we've uh, trading below at the time of recording. And, but uh, a break of there could uh, send us down to the 5000 level, which uh, is a 50% retracement of the uh, rally since January. Uh, but really, I think as soon as we start seeing any price action start to deteriorate or weaken from the current levels we're trading, the bigger question is what happens when a sell cycle feedback loop happens, when uh, the dealers have a, a gamma flip, when you have uh, those that are um, uh, vol targeting funds and or CTAs start getting some sort of distribution signals, uh, what kind of uh, a flood of selling happens and does it end up just being a couple hundred points or does it cascade into something bigger? Uh, it, a lot of interesting things to watch on the short term. Uh, I don't want to suggest that the implies that it has to be a really big drop, but uh, a correction is long overdue and we'll see uh, how deep it goes. Nonetheless, let's move on to page five where we have the NASDAQ on the QQQs. What levels are you watching? Right now, spot price on Qs is approximately 438. We have an implied move for next week's April 19th monthly OPEX of plus minus 10 points. Therefore, the upper implied move is 448 and the lower implied move is 428. Right now, we have key resistance at those all-time high areas of 450 and key support just below at 430. As I mentioned previously, I'm bullish on certain names, Apple and Google to be noted, and I'm bearish overall in big tech. I'm more bullish on small caps for the simple reason that if the market is to run higher, I believe breadth has to increase overall. But what you said before about that key level of 5,000 on SPX, I do see that being a key short-term target. And the second target I see is that previous all-time high back from January 2022 of 48.20 area or so. If we were to pull back somewhere to that area, that would imply a top-to-bottom move from the highs of about 8.5%. And as we saw last year in 2023... During the year, we saw two periods of 10% drawdowns, even though we finished the year up plus 23%. So overall, it's, it's important to be cautious right here, I think. Big tech is trading at all-time highs for a lot of names, and I don't see a lot more opportunity in those names in and of themselves. Nick, let's move on to the volatility index. All year, we've been in this range between the 12 handle to the 15 handle, uh, and it's contained volatility. But really, over the last week, and especially here in the post-CPI number, uh, we've seen vo- the VIX now trading decisively north of 15, now trading around the, on the 16 handle. We are now in a period where volatility is starting to rise. Now, I wouldn't call this a big breakout in volatility yet. I mean, we're not uh, north of the 20 handle, which is typically where we would start seeing, um, you know, true uh, shift in sentiment. But uh, clearly, there is some active grabbing on long gamma. What's your take on this? So with the fix at around 16, the implied move intraday top to bottom is approximately 1%, which is a pretty wide move overall. We're seeing insurance premiums increase and longer dated options as well as market participants hedge their positions. And right now, I think that's a good idea because, as you mentioned previously, with the geopolitical issues we're seeing in the Middle East, If anything pops off there, that could cause a severe spike to the upside, and we're looking at perhaps a 20-25 handle on the VIX. That would cause insurance premiums to spike overall and make portfolio hedging that much more expensive. So in the short term, I think it makes more sense to be more cautious and either scale out of longs or hedge your portfolios using put spreads, which are much, much cheaper than using outright puts. But right now, I think caution is of the utmost importance. 
So moving on to page seven, I just wanted to quickly touch on that 10-year U.S. government treasury bond yields chart. Uh, In the post-CPI and the FOMC uh, meeting minutes, we had a a substantial spike higher in bond yields, and it was a decisive breakout higher, which is certainly causing uh, many people to pay attention as to whether or not this inflation is going to start putting pressure on these bonds. Now, obviously, this type of a breakout really now asks the question, are we heading back to the October high near 5%? Uh, I want to really see uh, over the next week whether this uh, these higher levels of yields actually sustain or whether this mean reverts is certainly a thing to watch. And moving on to page eight, we have that gold futures chart and gold is screaming higher. I'm curious as, as to your thoughts here, guys. I've been thinking hard about gold this week and for the last several weeks, frankly, and I'm ready to go on record as saying that I'm convinced with strong conviction that there's more to this gold rally than meets the eye. Specifically, what I mean by that is that this rally simply doesn't jibe with real interest rates or the longstanding inverse correlation between gold and the dollar. And the rally has continued too far and too long to be explained by a short squeeze. So from all these factors combined, my conclusion is that someone is trading on non-public information. Now, before you dig out that tin foil hat I know you want to put on, I'm not suggesting any sort of wild conspiracy theories. This could be explained by something like a new plaza cord being in the works, as Luke Groman suggested here on Macro Voices, might have been the purpose of Xi Jinping's recent trip to San Francisco. Or it could be that one or more of the BRICS nations are getting ready to make good on their long-standing threats to ditch their dollar-denominated central bank reserve holdings and settle more trade in their own currencies. And perhaps the most likely explanation is that someone got advance inside information back in early March that a major geopolitical escalation in both the Gaza and Ukraine theaters was being planned by the U.S. military, and someone was front-running the news that Blinken would announce that Ukraine joining NATO was a done deal, or this week's CENTCOM announcement that the U.S. could join Israel in a hot war with Iran. This isn't just academic trivia, guys. Figuring out what's behind this move is essential to knowing where this gold market is headed next. It's already run far too high and far too quickly to make sense on historically normal correlations. So either it's gotten way ahead of itself and is overdue for a sharp downside correction and soon, or else there's more non-public news that hasn't come out yet that's going to drive it even higher. Until we figure out which, I don't know how to project what comes next, and my opinion is that neither does anyone else, except for those people who know what's really been driving this rally since early March, and I don't think it's based on publicly available data. You know, gold has had an extraordinary run. In in my framework, we always like to buy dips. So we're always looking for when does the existing trend pause and consolidate to allow a, an opportunity to reset the entry. Uh, at this stage, this is an incredibly bullish chart, but on the very short term, a little bit overdone. It's very typical for us to see pullbacks, uh, you know, 50 or even $100. That's just a little bit of a profit-taking cycle. My view is that that will ultimately result in a buy on dip opportunity that must be taken advantage of if it was to materialize. The most bullish scenario in my mind is if this entire consolidation keeps gold decisively above 2300, particularly if we're seeing stresses in other uh, risk assets and gold is not selling. If that's the case, that would make me that much more bullish. We'll see uh, what it looks like when uh, gold does a little consolidation here. Moving on to page nine, I just wanted to touch on copper. And uh, copper had this very bullish breakout that's got everyone's attention uh, heading back to those January 2023 highs. Uh, And it asked the question, is copper actually going through a brand new bull cycle? Uh, This is actually a very important moment. Now, there's no denying that copper is in a bull trend and particularly copper stocks are running uh, like they stole something. It's just like they, uh, it's it's just a beautiful bull 
bull run. Uh, but this resistance level will give a lot of information. If uh, this uh, copper price can bust through that January 2023 high, um, then it really solidifies that some sort of bigger uh, bull cycle is underway. And, and then we really have to question whether or not we're going to see a retest of the $5 levels that we haven't seen for several years. And moving on, I just wanted to touch on the dollar with you, Eric, here. Uh, obviously, uh, a big breakout. I was particularly noting that that U.S. dollar yen had the breakout above the 152 level, uh, but certainly some strength here in the dollar. What's your take on it? The third hot CPI print in a row pretty much confirms Jim Bianco's forecast here on Macro Voices. So kudos to Jim for that call. This latest hot CPI print took us from just below that critical 104 technical level on the Dixie to just above 105 in a single day. So now the question is whether the rally continues from here or retraces. Let's see what happens, but if we're going to continue to get these hot CPI prints, it's hard to see how the dollar doesn't move higher unless there's some intervention. Moving on to page 10, we have that uranium chart, which has peaked right above that 50-day moving average. Patrick, what are your thoughts here? Yeah, I just want to keep talking about this uh, uranium chart, especially after having Justin on the show. Uh, now, this has certainly continued to progress higher, but it hasn't done so with the spot price rising. And so this is uh, the discount to the net asset value is obviously closing. This really can't break out bullishly unless uh, we see spot uranium prices really join the party. With that said, uranium stocks are uh, very bullish right now, and it's starting to look like uh, this entire market is turning back up. It'll be really interesting to see if the next leg of the bull phase is getting underway here. Folks, if you enjoy Patrick's chart decks, you can get them every single day of the week with a free trial of Big Picture Trading. The details are on the last pages of the slide deck or just go to bigpicturetrading.com. That concludes this edition of Macro Voices. Be sure to tune in each week to hear feature interviews with the brightest minds in finance and macroeconomics. Macro Voices is made possible by sponsorship from BigPictureTrading.com, the Internet's premier source of online education for traders. Please visit BigPictureTrading.com for more information. Please register your free account at MacroVoices.com. Once registered, you'll receive our free weekly research roundup email containing links to supporting documents from our featured guests and the very best free financial content our volunteer research team could find on the internet each week. You'll also gain access to our free listener discussion forums and research library. And the more registered users we have, the more we'll be able to recruit high-profile feature interview guests for future programs. So please register your free account today at macrovoices.com if you haven't already. You can subscribe to Macro Voices on iTunes to have Macro Voices automatically delivered to your mobile device each week free of charge. You can email questions for the program to mailbag at macrovoices.com and we'll answer your questions on the air from time to time in our mailbag segment. Macro Voices is presented for informational and entertainment purposes only. The information presented on Macro Voices should not be construed as investment advice. Always consult a licensed investment professional before making investment decisions. The views and opinions expressed on Macro Voices are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect those of the show's hosts or sponsors. Macro Voices, its producers, sponsors, and hosts Eric Townsend and Patrick Ceresna shall not be liable for losses resulting from investment decisions based on information or viewpoints presented on Macro Voices. Macro Voices is made possible by sponsorship from BigPictureTrading.com and by funding from Fourth Turning Capital Management, LLC. For more information, visit MacroVoices.com.